You're listening to Arsenal Pass, a flesh and blood podcast for players by players. And all about strategy, leveling up, and the latest news in the world of Wraith. Welcome to Arsenal Pass. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to episode 104 of Arsenal Pass, two years in the books, and we're going to be bringing it back to the roots, talking about one of the most core topics in flesh and blood, which is to go first or to go second. Sounds like some sort of like philosophical, um, I don't know, dilemma, Hayden. What are your thoughts about this concept? And just like from a high level, how has it changed over the years? Because I remember when I first started playing this game, people were very passionate about one way or the other, but they didn't really have any good reasons to back it up. I think a lot of people's reasoning for a long time was just previous history. You know, in this TCG, it was better to do this. This TCG, it was better to do this. Uh, you know, I think Magic players historically like, well, you, you know, you want to you want to go first, uh, sort of thing. Get that get that advantage, but that doesn't work the same way in Flesh and Blood. So, look, it's a really interesting concept, and I think the reason we're going to hit on it today is because it's it's at its most important potentially than it than it has been because of. Uh, the fluidity of it outside limited because outside is limited rather because of this constructive format and the dominance or the, the prominence at least of rangers guardians etc mm -hmm. so yeah i think it's a it's a topic that we actually covered on patreon to a degree i want to say about five six months ago um but it's one that we think is we really wanted to visit uh, on the main pod because it is just so important of a topic i think and um let's talk about i do want to say as well two years brendan Congratulations to you, first mm. of all, for putting up with me for two years. <laughs> I feel like I feel like um, we just got married. This is great. Like a big stepping stone for us. You know, on, you know we're, we're on our way to a decade. We, we are, and <laughs> I mean, massive thank you to <laughs> massive thank you to our uh, well, it's it's cotton for two year anniversary. So, what have you what have you got me? Is it? Um, it's a surprise. Uh, you'll get it in Baltimore. Okay. Wink, wink. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Let's talk about that soon. Uh, but I want to say a massive thank you to all of the Arsenal Pass listeners and viewers and those that have supported us over the two years, those that have come up to us at events, those that have sent us nice and you know constructive messages <laughs> over the years. Yeah. Uh, just massive thank you. It's pretty wild, Hayden. If you actually think back the to the degree that this podcast has warped your social identity and sort of like how, I don't know, sort of like how you personify yourself, I guess. Like it's become such a core part of like who... I am that it's kind of it, it's very hard to verbalize right and I mean you just sum it up in this sort of two-year experience but it, it's fundamentally kind of changed my life and I know it's done the same for you and it's been an incredible experience and at the end of the day you know podcasting here talking with your friend uh, once a week that's one thing but the people that we've met along the way in the community that we're able to curate I think that's really what made it worth it and it's been quite a journey. I might say it's the people you meet along the way. <laughs> yep, as you say, uh, it's been it's been great. Well, uh, yeah, let's get past sentimental su sentimental stuff. <laughs> what about your week in flesh and blood? How's the draft format? How's it shaking up to be? Is it um, you know? Does it feel like the sealed format? Are we looking at a deep draft format here with a lot of play? Like I know some people. That, the reason why I ask is because I feel like there's uh, this past sealed for format. There's kind of a dichotomy. You know, some people love it, some people hate it, um, and there is a somewhat powerful my you know myopic strategy, I guess, in the form of assassin. Talk to me a little bit about your experience, though, post sealed now in draft. Mm. I haven't. I'd be interested to hear about the kind of I guess negative side of the sealed format. I, I've definitely heard some people have complaints and some criticism about. Like, for instance, you know, Ninja, mm -hmm. the one thing that's a lot more playable in draft than it is in sealed. Uh, but I think, you know, I, I've, I've revisited a sealed this past week, actually. I played Ninja. I think there's ways you can play Ninja. I think this idea that you just kind of play all the best cards in your pool is, is, is not necessarily correct. I do think it's correct to play more than 30. You have a lot of really close fringe playables, uh, especially if you're sitting in Assassin all the time, which is, which is good. And that, that is a viable sort of strategy. But the sealed format is... I think it's a lot deeper than, than people are probably giving it credit for as well, which is interesting. Uh, in terms of, I guess, the, the draft format, it, it does feel very different. You know, uh, the matchups are a lot more dynamic, I think. So the Ranger, sorry, the Assassin Mirrors, I think, are still often coming down to second cycle, but not necessarily fatigue. And that is, and it's actually, I guess, in sealed, actually, once people start to play more cards, fatigue was less likely because of the two blocks and 
things like this. But the the, the format is quite interesting from that perspective. The ranges I think are, are really interesting, particularly Azalea, uh, which is not a hero that I think is worth often looking at in sealed unless you have a crazy crazy seal pool. Is very good in in draft in the deck. I think if you get to put it together, is very strong. And then ninjas on the other side of it. I mean, I've had a, I think I've drafted Benji the most so far, and I think Benji is is really strong in draft um, and is a hero that. I think people can position themselves into, I wouldn't say force, but really like put position themselves into quite well in a lot of draft pods, I think, and, mm-hmm. and do well with. Yeah, I think when I talk about the dichotomy of the sealed format, it's more that I overall, I've seen a lot of positive feedback and it seems like it's well yeah. received on the aggregate, but it does, it does feel like for where people are split, you know, for the group that maybe doesn't like it as much, they tend to kind of really not like it because they don't like the extra cards and they don't like the more fatigue-esque kind of strategies. That being said, you know, that being a part of the sealed format or being sort of this like predefined uh, rail or play line is very much a week one, <laughs> like this, just this week one bro science of the, of the format. So you can see, you can see that stuff quickly, um, sort of quickly evolve. And we saw that back in Monarch specifically. I remember week in one, it was like everybody was complaining about Prism and Prism Pile. And I think that you know levia probably one of the least played decks in that sealed format was one of the best by far yeah it was it was especially if your um hexagor just always swung for six <laughs> and damage. oh my god i can't really remember <laughs> that oh i can't tell you how many times i read that card and i was just like yep wow that's really good <laughs> definitely remember that um i i mean yeah i i think the the sealed format in terms of the this idea of like fatigue being such a big player i think if once you play the sealed format more it it, it, it really isn't because you can play around 34 to 37 cards in most of the decks and the quality, the amount of two blocks versus three blocks you're going to have is really going to change and you're going to get to the point where you're not going to get to fatigue. And it's a different kind of fatigue. It's not just a case of throwing all your cards at the table. It is about playing your hands out, finding ways to force your opponent to block with cards, to buy cards, you know, to fatigue with damage as we, as we sort of say. Mm-hmm. So anyway, uh, yeah, good week in Flesh and Blood. Did a couple of drafts this week. Been playing reasonable amount of CC, uh, although I'm about to head off day or some travels so i haven't played the last two days I've been packing and sort of preparing but i mean the cc format is also really interesting and um i mean just to kind of small insight on that you know ultim is kind of the deck i think we're going to see a lot at the pt azalea of course um the format is kind of i think we talked about a lot last week around you know guardian ranger and then what do aggro decks look like mm-hmm. and that's the part that i've probably been struggling to understand because i also think lexi is really good and that kind of that can hamper that so Look, yeah, my, my next few weeks, I definitely want to play some, some aggro if I can and work it out. Yeah, so I made a sort of a note for myself. It's like at the beginning of April and for all of April is kind of when my PT prep starts. <laughs> we both have announcements for the PT, but like, I guess we're just kind of getting to them. I don't even know if I can announce mine yet, but people probably might suspect. But <laughs> that's why it's like I waited until April to kind of, you know, it's a bit... It's a bit less like, you know, three months of hardcore prep with the team. Um, but now I am diving into CC because it is very important that I have a, a kind of a deep grasp on the format. So that started in April and I've started off with Brody's Azalea deck, which by the way, if we can just transition to the news, we did have a deck tech with the prod- the prodigal son and flesh and blood upcoming pro player Brody Spurlock did an Azalea deck tech for us with a very nice list that he um, won the recent Realm Games uh, X min max tournament with. Um, it was a great deck tech. Brody's a very articulate, uh, presentable player, and he's extremely good. Always something to learn from him. So, been playing his list a little bit, and I like it. Azalea is in a really, really good place right now. Mm, I can't wait to watch it. Actually, I want to. I want to hear about. Cards like I asked them those questions, and, by the way. Uh, and you'll like it. I asked all the questions. Yeah, I'm you want looking to forward asked. to it. Yeah, looking forward to it. Just about take aim. That's mm-hmm. the card I'm really curious about. Of course, one of the best cards. <laughs> oh, <for> me. <laughs> um, yeah. I mean, just I guess in terms of that. So PT Baltimore coming up. Obviously, I've been testing. Brennan's getting into testing now. Are you going to allude to maybe what Brennan's <laughs> going to be doing yeah. come PT time? Uh, for myself, un- unfortunately, I'm not going to be in Baltimore. Uh, I was doing my utmost best to try and get there. From a work standpoint, I just have a lot on at that time. I'm actually taking a trip for work, and I can't, I can't make it to Baltimore. So pretty, a little bit gutted. Uh, I kind of, I think at the start of this year, I had decided that I might not go to one of the PTs, assuming two PTs and, and Worlds before the announcement. So prior to Christmas, obviously, once we got the announcement, just one PT and Worlds uh, became a lot higher priority for me to get to this PT. It's at the most awkward time possible for me, unfortunately. And even if I literally fly in, fly out on the on the Sunday. Uh, I wouldn't be back in time for a trip that I'm taking for work. So 
I'm gonna have to, gonna have to skip this one, but I have been preparing all the same, which has been great. Uh, not necessarily with with a, a group as we have done previously. Uh, mostly just with with Dan, who is kind of my primary sort of playtesting partner anyway. Trying to get some games in with Brendan at some point this month. We would definitely be playing and just preparing like I, I would normally, doing a lot of draft, trying to understand this format and trying to find out what what deck I'd play for Classic Constructed, yeah. which I'll, I'll definitely talk about on the pod the week of. I'll talk about the deck that that I would be sleeving up and taking based on, on my testing because that the testing process hasn't really changed for a minute. Mm. I'm going to end up at the same point. I'm just too interested in this format to <laughs> wanting to find out what I would do if yeah. I was there and feel like I, I could be there. <laughs> yeah, so, I mean, if we're going to follow the same suit, that that includes a lot of testing, working really hard in a lot of decks, and at the end, just playing Kano. Now, this this format is a, generally a, quite a hard one to prepare for if you are looking at sort of data as a way to try to map the meta. Um, I also There's think no that... Data. Yeah, well, there is. I mean, there's the recent tournament, the min max uh, realm games, sure. and I think that like that data is actually a bit of a red herring because of the lack of old him. And I even spoke to, when I was speaking to Brody Spurlock. You know, um, I did ask him specifically about this old him fatigue list and about you know the the ex boogeyman. He's like, yeah, Azalea is that's that's a really tough matchup. It's not unwinnable like it used to be, but it's not a good matchup. And so I think that you know just looking at the <laughs> small sample size we do have. Uh, it might not be indicative of what's actually going to show up at Baltimore. Yeah, Ultimate's one of those decks that really benefits from repetition and working out what the meta you expect is and then testing into it to find the best configuration for that hero because there's so many options available to you. So, you know, people have got a lot of work ahead of them, but there's so many groups, individuals that'll be at the PT who are just absolutely grinding the heck out of this format to find out. And I've heard from a few of them in terms of, you know, they're working really hard to try and understand what they want to play at, at this PT. So, yeah, it, it's going to be a really interesting format. It, it could be the most open PT level event we've seen so far in terms of X selection, you know, the most wide variety of, of mm-hmm. heroes um, and the least represented hero at number one that we've seen so far. Yeah. So that's going to be very cool. Well, I'd ask you a question, though. It's like if you had to predict right now, um, what, what would you say the number one deck is? You don't have to say top three decks. Just say what do you think the most mm-hmm. represented deck would be? I think it'll be Ultim. So do I. I think, people so do will, I. I think people will land because of the, the matchup spread. You know, you go into a wide meta, why not take a deck that has a really good matchup spread, a deck that you can tune to possibly matchups that you think are, are going to show up maybe in two, three, and four. And it just inherently is still really, really strong. Like it, it hasn't, you know, nothing's changed from prior to Outsiders. So the Dynasty season, Ultim was one of the best decks, even after the Winter's Well ban. And what's, what's risen in popularity? Ranger. Mm-hmm. And to me, you know, just in, just taking a step back and just looking at it holistically, that, that's a good thing for Guardian. Now, maybe the Azaleas, the Lexies, they find a really good game plan into the Ultim list that they're testing into. That's great. But maybe also those Ultim players find those plans for Ranger and counteract it, have a plan to counteract it. So, yeah, I'm um, I'm looking forward to see what people brought. I'm, I'm I have I think this is going to be the tournament though where some people come with some really interesting takes mm. and commit to them because. I'll feel like I've got nothing to lose. What am I falling back to? Maybe Ultima or Azalea or something and, and bringing something that is a bit off the beaten path. Yeah, I would say if I was dead set on trying to win the Pro Tour and we were, you know, the time of recording, April 3rd, I would really be asking myself right now, uh, what are the Europeans up to? Because I think that we've had, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, we are a bit uh, slanted in terms of our data from, from the United States. And I think Europe, if we look at past Pro Tours, past World Championships, they show up, they show up in force and they tend to top eight. So, you know, like, the last World Championship, perfect example, Briar saw almost no play on the Battle Hardened circuit that led all the way up to that tournament. And it was one of the most popular and best decks in, in, the, in the tournament. And Europe was absolutely on that ball. In Lille, you mean? Uh, no, this was in the World Championships. Right, right, right. Yeah, I think Brian ended up being a top five played deck, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's that's the thing. I mean, the same was the same as Sid and Leal, right? In terms of, you know, we expected people to be a little bit more defensive orientated and then you, the Europeans just all showed up on Briar and Fire. So, <laughs> <laughs> but for the most part, yeah. people tough to play them. old him in the, in the prism. Yeah, the prism for back in yeah. those days. But yeah, anyway, what else do we have here uh, I mean, in our news? Yeah, so... I guess I'm going to lead with still no news on what hacks or origin distribution will be used for the Pro Tour. And when I say this, I'm talking about draft. And if you haven't seen already, we talked last week about the differences in pack distribution between the Belgian print run and the Japanese print run. I also go over it in depth in the last episode of Limited Time Only, um, episode three. But it is it is something that I think needs to be addressed. I'm really hoping that LSS address it this week so that players, unfortunately now not myself, uh, but 
something that I've been trying to ask and find out is what is the pack distribution going to be for the PT? Are we going to be using the Belgian print run or the Japanese print run? Because it, it, it does matter, I think. It, it does really vary. So and we took that last week. So I won't drone on about it, but still no announcement. Uh, we did, however, get an organized play announcement for mid-year, uh, which is going to see a, a slew of Battle Hardens happening, uh, which is very exciting. So I think uh, if I just talk about Battle Hardens, we've got Baltimore, Cincinnati, Chicago, Hong Kong, Atlanta, and Columbus. So it takes us from June all the way through to September. And then we also have Calling Singapore, June 9th to 11th, which I will be there. 100% I will be at that one. So, uh, yeah, like I say, unfortunately can't be at Baltimore, but I'll be at that calling and I'll be at the Australian calling that is scheduled for sometime end of year. And Alice has also said in this announcement that uh, at April Thursday, April 27th at the Players Reception in Baltimore, the rest of the year's schedule will be announced. So that is, a, I mean, that's a pretty big move on, Brendan, from where we've been in the past of so probably yeah. April, you're going to find out where Worlds is, whereas previously, what was it, sort of July? Uh, yeah, it's it's definitely a big upgrade. I remember, um, you know, back in the day, not too long ago, we were definitely putting LSS on blast for the, the late announcements. And I think that they've made a significant effort and step forward in getting us information sooner because it, it, it it's a big deal, especially if you're a player. Like if you're a player that's trying to take this seriously, um, I mean, timing is everything. Those <laughs> flight costs go like 3x and it's it's tough. Yeah, I mean, even, I mean, I had to really delay my planning for Baltimore because I, I wasn't sure initially when it was announced. I thought, yeah, I can, I can make this. And then uh, things have changed from a personal circumstance with, with work. So I was like, up until this past week, as Brenda knows, I was trying to see if I could still make it with some like crazy turnaround in and out flights. But also those flights have just gotten so expensive as well, which is, is really tough. So I think the, you know, the giving players extra planning time is, is really valuable. And I think players are really going to, um, respond to that so i think we'll see i think we'll see some really positive words coming for alice on that front uh rules and policy update i don't know if you caught this brendan it was kind of snuck in there it wasn't as as because the organized play announcement came at the same time but there has been a tournament rules and policies update a lot of it actually interestingly i read through it brendan so you didn't have to also our audience doesn't necessarily have to uh although i recommend just taking a quick look is a lot of it is like renaming of stuff and clarifying that you're able to do stuff that people were already doing so Card pool is now going to be called, uh, sorry, the deck is now going to be called the card pool because Alice's reasoning is that you don't submit the same 60 necessarily all the time, right? It's not, not a deck, it's a card pool. Inventory instead of sideboard, which inventory had already been moved mm -hmm. towards uh, in the set. They just clarify the use of shortcuts, out of auto play, out of auto play and reversing actions, which I think is a really good clarification about the use of shortcuts now that we have a lot of things that can speed the game up and require that. Game information, they just clarify some things around like what is information, what is visible, what is public. They add some criteria here around like assisted information, historical information, um, which is good. Markers. So this is something that was in the rules and policy before, but we've been seeing it on stream as people denoting like attack with dice, mm -hmm. you know, things like that, which actually wasn't in the rules and policy, uh, at least not to this degree. Um, in 4.7, it was actually just about, hey, you can't leave things here to give you basically note taking. It came under note taking some of the mm -hmm. time. So uh, they've just clarified that game layout. Um, just saying that you can now separate things like your Phoenix Flame from your graveyard. So previously that wasn't in the rules and policy, although people were doing it anyway, and I think the judges were letting that happen. That is now clarified in the rules and policy that you can do it. You can separate your Banish for Blood Deck cards as well now, Brennan, which people were already doing when playing Chain back a yeah. year and a half, two years ago. Uh, and then just some other notable changes that they've talked about is um, like round recommendation. This is the very last thing, and I think you'll enjoy this one, is that recommended first rounds have now been recalculated to ensure that uh, the top eight playoff contains one undefeated player and any players that are X1. So mm -hmm. if there's any chance that a player at X1 could miss, there would be basically an extra round added at the start of the tournament by calculating the number of players in the event instead of getting to the feel bad of, oh, I lost round one on this battle hardened. I can't make top eight. Yeah, um, the play zones is particularly nice. I, honestly, back in the day with Chain, it felt more angle shooty for someone to put everything in their banish zone in one pile rather than to spread it out because people would stick that eclipse like somewhere down there and you're like, Where the, what's, what is that over there? And then they eclipse you and you're like, where'd that come from? Um, so that that's nice. I wonder if I can finally legally put my equipment in the quad format, the superior format. Um, to, you know, or, no, but... <laughs> you know, but that's okay, yeah. Uh, elsewhere news wise, Gomish season six starts this weekend. So, you know, if you've got no other plans for your Easter, there's, there's Gomish season starting 8th to 23rd of April, Blitz and Sealed Deck format. Uh, Limits of Time Only, episode three is up. It's all to me. 
there's no there's no episode this week but there is a draft walkthrough that's going to go up so sorry for audio listeners of limited time only there won't be an episode this week but there will be a video up on youtube so if you usually listen on audio platforms go and check it out it's a full draft walkthrough of a draft from the weekend uh, i think it's a very interesting draft as well really focuses on sort of pivoting and and understanding taking signals in this format Mm-hmm. Yeah, and then, as you said, deck tech, right? Deck tech with Brody. I just wanted to mention on top of that, Brody did write an additional sideboard guides with tips and tricks t- for specific matchups up on Patreon. So check that out. Also on the Arsenal Pass Patreon, there's a slew of past deck techs, deck guides, all that good stuff, and uh, some additional content as well. And then we already talked about it, but yeah, unfortunately, it won't be the PT. So see anyone in Singapore going to be there? Let us know. But Brendan will be in Baltimore, so you can go and harass him. Mm. Well, I know you're going to be at the next one, Hayden. Uh, hope the I would loca- definitely 100%. Hope the location 100% be is good on, on Worlds. Hope the location is good. Hope it's accessible. Um, I'm pumped for it. I'm, I'm pumped. I think Look, Worlds I think is going to be great. I think we're, I, I think we're, even if it's in Lille, I'd be there. <laughs> yeah. Lille, Lille, so to be honest, Lille is a little bit of a meme. The only re- the worst things about Lille were, in my opinion, was just it was very warm and there was no air conditioning. Outside of that, it's it's a charming little town for sure. <laughs> but I, I'm really hoping Worlds is going to be a really good venue because I know LSS really want to nail it this time. Um, I thought that Worlds last year was okay. The venue was, you know, it was different. But overall, I think we can take that. We can level it up. And this year can be huge for the World Championships. So I'm super excited. And I would love another excuse to go back to Europe because I had a freaking awesome time <laughs> uh, last time. But speaking of Europe, speaking of Lille, speaking of bad French food, uh, let's go into the Command and Cookout section. This is from Mad Hatter. Mad Hatter says, do you think that Riptide's lack of dominate makes him a fundamentally worse Ranger than Azalea? Untalented. Given that Rangers work with connecting powerful hit triggers. By the way, when I talk about French food being bad, it's a joke. It's my favorite food. Um, but Hayden, what do you think about Riptide? And I'm assuming this is in reference to Classic Constructed and not to Limited. But uh, yeah, Dominate and ev- in Evasion is an interesting thing to calculate, right? Because it's dynamic and <laughs> it depends. If you dominate something that attacks for two, your Dominate is actually worth zero. It doesn't mean anything. But Dominate on the right hit trigger that's a tall enough attack can be devastating. Red and Ledger hitting is core to Azalea winning games a lot of the times. So how do you evaluate dominate and how does that sort of, tr- how does that transition to how you value Riptide versus Azalea when you're looking to pick a, uh, a Ranger there? It, it comes, it's really hard to evaluate dominate, like you say, in terms of what's it worth if you're trying to, if you're trying to give a value to dominate. It's really dependent on what the attack is, like you say, but, I think one thing you can start with is trying to value the hero ability. Now, Azalea's whole hero ability is this dominate effect. And it, it does have this kind of filtering effect to a degree, which does really help. You know, I've got this thing stuck in my arsenal. I flip it into a non-attack action, then play my arrow from hand, for instance, right? Because you can scale one cross wrap to opt. And that, that can really be super helpful. It can almost be, you know, like draw a card, put a card to the bottom, except you get to opt first, which is powerful. On the other side, Riptide has like a really powerful hero ability. And I'm, I'm not talking about this trap ability. I'm talking about this ability to get a free reload. Because usually if you want to reload, you have to either have the text on a card that says reload, something like a game or overflex, or you have to use your, your bow to put a card into your arsenal. And Riptide can avoid all of that. It can just get a free card into arsenal. And what, what is one of the things that the criticism of arrows, right, is the fact that, you know, they cost. It's like, well, you know, there's this, here's this, let's take like tearing shot, for instance, right? Because zero for four. Be zero for five beyond hit effect, and it's like comparing that to snatch. It's like, well, I have to play this arrow. I have to pay a resource or pay a cost to get into my arsenal, even if that's the cost of my weapon or that's the cost of one resource, whatever it might be. With Riptide Hero ability, you can not have a cost. You can just, you know, you can do it for free, and that is that is the power of that hero ability. Plus, then of course you get the tacked on sort of text with with the trap damage, which I don't think is. I mean, it's not irrelevant in in a lot of builds and matchups. It's going to be very relevant, but I think that. It text about how you get arrows into arsenal is the most important so if you're trying to evaluate those two it's like okay well what can i do with those i think is more important than just trying to say it doesn't have dominate versus does have dominate what can i do with three arrows into arsenal would be sort of your question mm-hmm. um as opposed to just why well, i don't have dominate how do i get power yeah i think my follow-up question would be like so if we look at if we look at something like lexi and we look at azalea like those two the shells of the decks that would be uh sort of associated with those heroes are different like they're very very different when you look at a riptide uh ranger deck and you look at an azalea deck are they 
that different, right? Are they built that different? Or would you kind of run the same deck in each hero? So you, it's kind of like a pick your poison in terms of the ranger. Like is Riptide different enough that there's a reason to run him over the Azalea, which is going to make those, like on, in my opinion, what makes Azalea so good right now is the evasion and is the on hit triggers, right? That's why it's so good against the decks it's good against. Um, so taking that away, it's like, is it good enough, right? And is the deck different enough? Like, it does Riptide, is it unique? Like, can you build a deck list that actually caters enough to Riptide's ability to leverage it and make it as powerful as Azalea? I don't know if it's making it as powerful as Azalea. Like, Azalea has this really linear kind of function, right? Like, it's powerful on hit effects in an, an aggro kind of shell. And Death Dealer is a really big part of what, what drives that, to be honest. Skull and Crossrape and Death Dealer, those are just two really powerful pieces of, of weaponry and equipment. And Azalea has access to them, or it always has. But now the thing that's pushed Azalea to a point where it's so strong is it has consistency of these on-hit effects and it has consistency of the pumps that help you provide these on-hit effects. You know, look at the Lace With cycle. Those, those cards can really represent 0-5, which is not something Azalea's had in the past, plus the consistency. Whereas I think Riptide, yeah, it's very different. I think if you're looking at that deck, you're looking to use those hero ability, you're looking for a reason to play it or potentially maybe down the road, it is going to be a different deck. It's not going to be just the same shell that I played in Riptide because h- how do you leverage that? It's not going to be the same sort of thing. Um, it's going to be, you know, you've got this access to this draft. Like, look at Limited, right? Mm-hmm. And my experience in outside this draft so far is that an Azalea deck looks quite different to a Riptide deck. An Azalea deck doesn't really want traps, to be honest. It kind of hurts what you're trying to do over on your game plan. Riptide really wants those. It wants to put cards into Arsenal with its hero ability. It wants to play, you know, a mix of some really strong five-cut hands, four five-cut hands, and a mix of, like, two-cut hands pump and to reload the zero cost arrow and play it or one cost off my equipment for instance and swing sort of tempo and take cards that way whereas azalea is really about sort of getting to spots in the game where you can have these impactful dominate arrows and push you know on hit effects that are really relevant and represent big chunks of damage Mm -hmm. Awesome. Well, if you want to get your question, well, thank you, Matt, uh, Matt Hatter, by the way. But if you want to get your question read out on next week's pod for the Commander Cookout section, shoot us a comment on YouTube specifically, um, and we'll get it queued up. Hayden, on to the main topic of the pod, which is an oldie, but a goodie. It's We started off. So you won the die roll, Hayden. Are you going first or are you going second? Across the board, what's the answer? What's the, what's the easy way to understand this? Well, I'll tease them out for one more second because I feel a little bit bad that we didn't actually answer Matt Hatter's question Mm-mm-mm. just quickly. Is Riptide fundamentally a worse hero than Azalea? I think the answer is no. Just, just to clarify. <laughs> uh, on that said, Riptide versus Azalea, I've won the die roll. What am I going to do? It, uh, it depends. I mean, right? It, 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 it does depend. It does depend. It, it, that's the thing is there's no clear answer that's going to apply to every situation in Flesh and Blood. My heuristic for this specific question is you need a compelling reason to go first in Flesh and Blood. That's my personal heuristic. Do you agree with it, Hayden? Why? Why? Because oh, I, feel I, like, why. I feel like you get more value by going second in Flesh and Blood. And you, if you're going first, you need to be able to make up for that lost value. Um, and you can do that through evasion, through setting up permanence on the board. Uh, and that's pretty much it, I think, right? You set up, or maybe if you're, I guess if your deck is so linear and so aggressive and you have a exponentially more powerful five card hand than you do four card hand, maybe like in the past, these Briar decks, they were also using evasion, sneaking in arcane damage sometimes with the weapon on turn zero as well. But that deck really prioritized the arsenal, specifically go back to Cheerio Briar, getting that plunder on arsenal, really important. Um, so I think he would choose to go first there, but I prefer to go second because I basically get to first tempo of the game, right? I'm taking cards out of the opponent's hand. I'm putting on relevant hit triggers, et cetera. Yeah, the example you can use is you take 40 or 60, doesn't really matter, yellow hit jabs and you shuffle them up and you play a mirror match. Mm-hmm. Going second is correct. <laughs> you know, going second is correct because you can block out what your opponent does on the first turn and then you can have the first meaningful attack and you, you get to an in-game state where... I mean, actually, in that situation, you just both fatigue. It's probably red head jab, head jab might be a better uh, description of that. But I guess the thing is, is that you, I mostly agree with you. I think it, it, it's really hard to even just say that you should always have a compelling reason to go first because in some formats, it, it just might, it might be the opposite. But I think probably the overall, uh, using you, you, your favorite word, Brendan, mm-hmm. heuristic, you're probably right. You need a compelling reason to go first. And, and we, I mean, we would never, we would never podcast today if it was just you go first or you go second, right? Like there mm-hmm. is a lot more to it. Yeah. 
Well, I mean, we might have a podcast if it was you go first, you go second, but there's still some part of the community that believe the opposite, which is kind of the case, actually. Like, people are very torn on this issue. I think that, you know, in some formats, it's really clear. Like, Uprising was really clear <laughs> whether you want to go first or second. But in others, I mean, back in Welcome to Race Sealed, you know, people sort of had a personal preference on going first or second. And this was across the board in Heroes. I think that it was quite dependent on what hero you're playing in that format but you know the community was split i think nowadays or at least in uprising the community was less split but maybe as we head into outsiders we sort of running into that um you know some people decide to go first some people choose to go second kind of scenario yeah there was still a lot of i would say you know quote unquote professional players players playing at the pro tour level who would go first in some matchups in uprising limited which you know that's a really interesting take but i, I know for a while we thought it was correct to go first in the Wizard Mirror, for instance. Mm-hmm. Um, so it it is pretty dynamic, which is interesting. Yeah, I mean, with the five, five with five, five was the most I think polarizing uh, example of this in recent history. And I think that the only way that a sort of going first five could pay off is if you had like multiple. Um, lava burst or honestly if, yeah if you were likely to draw lava burst you could kind of go over the top and leak quite a bit of damage but outside of that it was like it felt so bad to go yeah, if your deck was just better yeah if your deck was just better or you drew i don't know red sigil on turn one on turn zero why don't we talk a little bit about i guess this i mean we kind of talked a little bit but the narrative has been ongoing why does it matter in flesh and blood i think is a really interesting question and you kind of alluded to it by saying you know you need a you need a reason to go first because there are advantages and disadvantages to both. And the, the main thing I think you're going to find is it's going to be based around hero, deck, and game plan, right? And even card choices um, to what you want to do. I think the first thing you want to understand, I guess, the, the, like the base level when you're trying to decide first versus second is like, what do you want to do? That's always the first base level. Mm-hmm. What does your deck want to do? What does your game plan want to do? What do you think in this format based on how things play out you want to do? And I'll use Outsides Limited as an example, right? If you, week one, going into sealed, it's pre-release, you think it's going to be a fatigue-based format. You think people are going to play pile, you think it's going to be a fatigue-based format. You have a really good reason to go first because you get to take cards from your opponent. You get to swing with your weapons, you get to present damage and take cards from your opponent first. Now, on the flip side of that, if you're going to Uprising and you, you think it's going to be, like you say, a lot of fire mirrors in a really fast format, well, my deck has a lot of incentive to want to go second in every matchup because I get the first meaningful attack, like Brennan says. I get the first time to actually utilize my cards and push damage thresholds or push the sort of the delta of damage so you talk about um, needing to understand what your game what your game plan what game plan you're trying to uh turn trying to enact what your deck is trying to do how much consideration are you bringing into it of what your opponent's deck is trying to do how much does that weigh in on your decision whether you want to go first or second well that's that's the second level that's once you've decided what your sort of preferences and it's not always easy to decide that by the way like your deck could be happy going first or second it could be really marginal you might have ways to really utilize a good arsenal setup or permits to put on the board but also you might have good ways to really drive tempo on your second turn you know i don't i don't think of a specific example maybe you've got like some ninja deck that has a lot of permanents like epod and jerkin and stuff and then you've got also great ways to you know trigger mask obviously if you go second your opponent's game plan then becomes the next step of it it's like okay Say I overwhelmingly want to go first because I think this is going to be a fatigue-based format in, in Outsiders. And then I peer into Benji. Well, if I, go, if I go first, does that mean them on the second turn, they're just going to be able to push unblockable damage with their full hand and not only have the first meaningful attack, but actually sneak through damage because of the Benji hero ability? Does that mean that maybe I'm not going to fatigue? You know, they're going to try and take the game not to fatigue, for instance. So now all of a sudden my opponent has like a really good incentive to go second. Um, then to complicate that more, Brennan, my opponent gets to go first. Does that mean they get free damage because of the Benji hero ability? Mm. So it's like evasion. you're trying to consider first. I think evasion yeah, exactly. is, a, is a big keyword. And like if we're talking level ones of why you want to go first, I think the easiest thing to grasp onto initially is evasion. So Hayden, why don't you tell me a little bit about some of the reasons of like why you go first? I think that's the best thing to attack because it's a bit more obvious why you want to go second. But what are some general reasons of why you would want to go first? Yeah, I mean... You're the first player to get to play the five card hand is pretty important. So if your deck is really based around big five card hand setups, then getting to Arsenal on turn zero, you should find a really, you know, the card you want in Arsenal and then set up for the first five card hand can be really important. Um, you know, we saw some of this with people discussing this with like Fi in sort of the pre-Dynasty meta, so the Uprising meta and Constructed. Mm-hmm. Um, 
I mean, Ultim as an example would get a card for Crown of Seeds, plus can potentially dominate an attack. You know, you've got all these blue dominant, you've got Machu Grandes, you've got uh, Glacial Footsteps, so you potentially have a way to push damage, which is what we just talked about, evasion. That's a, it's a reason you might want to go first. You have a lot of good ways. Azalea in this current format, I think a lot of people are defaulting to go first because, mm-hmm. you know, I can potentially just load an arrow and find immediately a dominated arrow off the top of the deck, which is maybe a little bit risky, mm-hmm. <laughs> um, depending on what your deck looks like, but a reason. Bravo is another uh, example of persistent on an effect that affects the following turn of the game. Mm-hmm. Plus, Bravo gets to set up the the arsenal. Like, uh, I, I mean, this is that's pay dominate. Yeah, exactly. the 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 idea of you being able to present an evasive attack um, that maybe does more than just takes life, right? Something like Bravo is something that has been a part of the game since Welcome to Wraith. Like in Welcome to Wraith in the sealed format, it was almost it was almost clear that Bravo was one of the stronger heroes, and people would often choose to go first because they. You know, you could debilitate someone on turn zero. You could maybe spinal if you had opened that card. Like it's a it's a pretty relevant reason to go first because you get the damage, you get the arsenal, and your opponent is suffering from an on hit effect on their following turn. Yeah, and you can wrap all those those things you talked about, right? So let's let's use the example we're playing Bravo and Welcome to Race Sealed. Maybe we don't have that many good arsenal targets in our deck, you know, um, outside of some of these red attacks. But the blue attacks, we don't really want arsenal. But on the flip side of that, we could we could know that we just have so many cheap blue cheap uh, cheap attacks that we want to dominate, for instance, and that that could be a reason enough to to go first. So it's all really contextual, and I think you need to think through. Like we say, first thing, what am I trying to do? Second thing, what am I my opponent trying to do? In terms of other advantages for for going first, you know, taking board setup is really important. So taking advantage of that turn zero for setup. So dash is like a really good example with getting an item out. I can't tell you the amount of times that mm-hmm. an opponent goes turn zero and goes and finds like either the second chamber or um purifier or goes in the aggro matchup goes and finds their their next tickler pounder or their tickler core so they've got four resources for the next two turns they've they've more than made up for for going you know going first and me getting the the, the tempo on on turn one uh you know viscerai making rune chance that was like a you know a thing that people would do would go first in the mirror matches to sit up six seven eight yep <laughs> depending on who you are and how well it was so much better to go first than it was to go second because i mean the deck that deck really broke the paradigm of like what power was in flesh and blood especially in the blitz format but it was so ridiculously powerful to just generate a couple rune chants on the first on turn zero on the first turn of the game you don't care if your opponent hit you with the the freaking kitchen sink on the following turn you know they get the first tempo because it doesn't matter because you win the next turn so it's like it was it, it was an interesting game but you are setting up sort of this permanent at the same time by setting up any amount of permanence with that deck you were effectively setting up like an exodia combo on the the mm-hmm. second turn of the game right like the following turn so your opponent can hit you with everything you know they can get the first tempo the, it doesn't matter the, the the numbers were simply too high and the deck was way too powerful but i thought that blitz, i think blitz viscera is a fascinating example of of a deck that really wanted to go first and it was like very clear that if you lost that die roll, it's like, I mean, you lost like a huge margin to win that game. Let's let's Rhinos felt the same, to be honest, <laughs> a little bit, uh, which is interesting. So non-interactive damage evasion, like we talked about before, is also a really big point. But we talked about dominate. I mean, there's others. There's arcane damage. You know, matchup where maybe you're playing Kano or Icelander, and you expect your opponent to flip up low AB so you can get free damage. Like, that is potentially a really good reason to to go first outside of board development yep uh, with the Kano deck too you can potentially see more cards you know by going first you're starting towards zero you are presenting evasive damage so that is part of it but you know using Kano's ability potentially drawing with tomes like you are seeing more cards Kano's a deck where you want to see as many cards as possible E-pot. yeah e-pot yeah they're permanent the <laughs> developing deck. a permanent yeah. uh but the the being able to see more cards in that deck is absolutely non-zero because even if you were to block with your entire hand by going second you're only seeing kind of four more cards but if you're going first turn zero you can see a ton because you can't into a tome draw 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 and you're really looking to find a single card uh which is aether wildfire and put that in your arsenal kind of asap in 90 percent of matchups so there was a there was definitely a very tangible benefit to going first but it was it was a lot of things right evasive damage permanence and you know finding your combo I think the the big thing to consider as well, we talked about step one, my game plan, step two, my opponent's game plan. So all these considerations we just talked about, the arsenal, the ability to play five card hands, evasion and non-interactive damage, taking advantage of turn zero setups, getting your board presence underway, uh, maybe even killing your opponent, uh, which, you know, I'm sure you've 
happened with Reiner. I, I had, there's a we were testing for the calling, the team calling, mm-hmm. and Nick Nick Butch has a screenshot where I just killed him turn zero with Reiner, like immediately our first game of testing. I just like flipped it and I was like, huh. just rush a bit down, Lotus yeah. Bellow. <laughs> Reiner was uh, Reiner. It's I think with Reiner it was uncommon. Uh, with Blitz Viserai, it, yeah. it, it was rare. And with Kano, it's kind of super rare, but you can do it. Uh, but yeah, I mean there are decks that absolutely can just kill their opponent on turn zero. <laughs> we, we don't we don't talk about this. I love those uh, decks. So yeah, <laughs> non interactive damage, turn zero setups, arsenals. These things are really important. But also, what can be important if you take it to the next step is if I go first, I deny my opponent the ability to do these things. And how important is that? Maybe your game plan going first is so-so. You know, there's a couple of things I could do. I have some non-interactive damage. I have some oceans or whatever it might be that I want to set up. Maybe a five-card hand can be really beneficial to me on, on turn two. But my opponent, on the other hand, you know, this, this, this dash player I'm playing against, well, they, they, really want to, they really want to go first and take advantage of it. So if you had to guess before you sort of get on to going second in Flesh and Blood, right now in this format, what percentage of people... And the decks they're playing, not what they want to. I guess correct decision is to go first versus second. How many? Uh, what percentage of decks is it the correct decision to go first? Yeah, and 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 let me. Yeah, an average tournament. Actually, let's say this: an average tournament, first versus second. What do you think is overwhelmingly, or I guess even give me a percentage? What do you want the correct decision, first versus second, in class constructed right now? In average tournament, I think it's going to be correct to go second. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's across the board, though. I think in almost every format in Flesh and Blood, like literally any way you could play the game, even Ira decks, like I think it's going to be correct to go second. That's the thing that gets us back to our base heuristic, which is you just need, like, it's not that going first is wrong. It's that you need a reason and you, it has to be a part of your game plan. It has to be powerful enough to offset what is effectively a loss in card advantage, which I think is what you can equate going first to versus going second. Going second could be, a, I think, Michael Hamilton explained some math to me that, you know, obviously went way over my head at the point. It was pretty simple, to be honest, but equates going second to card advantage. But Card advantage isn't everything in flesh and blood, and you can do things that are powerful enough to warrant going first. So, yeah, I think in an average tournament, literally doesn't matter the format. It's probably going to be uh, more correct to go second more often than it is to go first. Yeah, cool. I'm glad you touched on this idea of going second as card advantage. That's something I wanted to talk about when it comes to going first versus second, and that's can you or your opponent, if you're in a position to go second, utilize the cards in your hand? Because if you can only play one card in hand and it's for say six damage so say it's all you can do with your hand on average is going to be present a six damage attack have you really gained card advantage that way nope i mean if if in, if, the, if the game is just playing like six attacks back and forth for instance and maybe there's some ways to push damage here and there realistically maybe you have gained a slight card advantage but if you're coming back in with six your opponent has the option to actually use their hand i'll block with two cards use my hand and then present you with seven or eight damage for instance like and, and they get to utilize that card in Arsenal and utilize the hand the way they want. So it, it can be sometimes, I think, this idea of like card advantage, going second is card advantage. Often in Constructed, I think, that can be really true because you get to set up the deck you, the way you want. People are building decks that use their four and five card hands really easily, can use their whole hand. But in Limited, I think this is a lot less prevalent. And I think in this one in particular, it's, it's really interesting when we talk about outsiders, going second, sometimes, you know, your deck just will not be set up for it. You just... It's not going to happen in this format unless you're playing maybe Benji or Arachne. One thing that I think is particularly interesting about going second in Flesh and Blood, and it's not one of the main reasons, it's more of like one of the secondary tertiary reasons, is you get to target filter your hand, right? So if I draw a hand and it's not very playable, ideally, if my opponent presents even a single attack, I can filter that away. But also, I can draw four cards and I can have, you know, three replacement level cards and I can have, let's say I'm playing Runeblade, I have one Malvern Skies. I just don't have to, I, now I get to just keep that card, don't have to block with it. And I, it, like, I get to keep the one most powerful card in my deck. I'm not actually obligated to block with it. And I can throw away the three other cards and hopefully draw something that works. And I think that's really, really powerful because you're seeing more cards and you're able to sort of target filter that way. Cause it could be the single Moff Skies, but it could also be you have Moff Skies plus, uh, sorry, Marvin Skies plus more, more, uh, Mordred Tide. Um, and like you have this really powerful interaction. Now you just block with two cards, um, by going, uh, by going second on the flip side of that though i think you could say that first allows you to filter cards because my opponent doesn't attack me i don't i don't get that ability to filter cards whereas first you can always decide whether or not to 
dump your hand, whether mm-hmm. or not to get rid of cards. Whereas going second, you you don't that that decision isn't in your hands. That's in that's in your opponent's hands a lot of the time. Yeah, so, it's one of the worst feelings of flesh and blood is when you do draw a really bad hand and you're going second and your opponent or goes, goes Arsenal pass <laughs> or turn one permanent. And you're like, oh. <laughs> no. Yep, yep. Well, then you just use Kano's ability. You know, no problem. <laughs> yeah, if you played any is. <laughs> You played any Azalea in this format though, and you uh, draw all non-attack actions going second. Your opponent goes, "Yeah, I'll just pass." Yeah, head in hands, head in hands. Same with uh, Briar in, in previous formats. Oh yeah. What about what about where, like going second? Let's just go through some of the high level, some of the strengths with going second that I think are really important to consider when you're weighing out the system first versus second. Uh, you own the chance to take tempo first. We just talked about this before. You have the first what we call like real attack of the game, um, and you can effectively start. The, the tempo, the damage ship, you can set the pace of the game if if going second. A lot of the time, this won't always be true because of things like Brennan just talked about on hit effects, board and permanent setup, but a lot of the time going second is going to allow you the opportunity to do this if you can use your hand. Mm-hmm. No, definitely. Um, I mean, that also impacts, like, I think by going second, generally, like, you can often be ahead on sort of the armor race, like the armor economy. It, it just, it equates directly to the sort of the card economy and what you'd be blocking with anyway, and getting the first tempo attack of the game but all of it sort of coalesces together and gives you in general more value by going second right because you are presenting the first relevant attack you are presenting the first relevant on hit triggers now your opponent has to deal with that break point of four they can't just take it right that snatch actually means something where you know it turns out doesn't mm-hmm. can often mean nothing yeah yeah I'm, I'm on the back of that it's also the chance to get the first impact of on hit effects you just talked about it right there you know you present a snatch which on turn zero could potentially not not mean anything or you know it's it's you block it out and it doesn't cost you tempo on your next turn it's you can deal with it in, in multitude of ways either the on hit might not be as relevant because your opponent still has a card in hand or you know what i can block this out i'm going to redraw anyway whereas on turn one going second now that has consequence you know, if i block this card out if i went first and my opponent goes second they present me with this on hit effect and i block it out the consequence is i don't have those cards to play on my turn to do what i want to do so i think you know if you think about Dorinthia and Dawnblade, traditionally just the deck that just always wants to go second, right? Like just mm-hmm. has, as ha, since Flesh and Blood has started, it's been the deck that has this like really good incentive to go second because you get the first impact to the first chance to impact on hits and Dorinthia rolls on hits. It rolls these these Dawnblade tokens through. So that's, a, I think, a really good example of a deck that's traditionally just wanted to go second. Mm-hmm. I want to slightly tangent and ask you about a, what I think is a really important question of flesh and blood and something I think is criminally, criminally overlooked, but is very related to going first and going second, which is how do you, how do you change your pre-boarding and do you ever change your pre-boarding on whether you're going first or you're going second? question yeah <laughs> it's definitely it, def- it definitely it definitely it's it depends of course but i think a lot of people they'll look at a sideboard guide and they'll have you know x cards come in versus alia and they never consider whether they're going first or they're going second and if it matters and it's kind of a hard concept to grasp in flesh and blood i think but a great example for it is something like command and conquer like i think command and conquer can be a lot better on the draw going second because your opponent is going to be highly likely to arsenal a card on turn zero therefore making your command and conquer much more likely to be live i think it's mattered more in the past where there's been this kind of you know that example i think is a really good example whereas now i think if you're playing command and, Con- uh, command and conquer for a matchup you're playing command and conquer because it's good in the matchup whereas you've just got so many other strong cards that are vying for that spot you know what i mean so it's like I'm I'm probably playing that because I'm wanting to play it into Ranger. Whereas like if I'm just playing going second into this aggro deck because I don't want to have a five card hand, well first of all I have to draw that, I have to find that before I, I go second. And actually what does that card do later in the game? Is it actually just worse than the card I'll be replacing? Because my, my replacement level is so high, my power level of my deck is so high. So I do think that used to be a, a thing we considered a lot in our testing, like first for second, there were like slight cyborg tweaks, things like that. I think, to be honest, it's pretty low down on the list of things you need to consider these days, but I do think it's something that is still relevant. And particularly, I actually think it's most relevant and limited. So, you know, if I'm going second, maybe my opponent wants to die roll and they go first and they're playing Assassin. I think they're probably going to be, they're going to have an eye, one eye on fatigue, potentially. Does that mean that my last two fringe playables come into the deck because they have some more relevancy there? Uh, is it a case of, you know, going first and uprising? Like, traditionally, it's like, okay, is this, can I sideboard on my sigil, you know, mm-hmm. to give me some potential protection to mitigate going first here absolutely there's things like that there's things like that for sure but i I think it is a lot less important and constructed than it has 
maybe have been early on in the, in the game, whereas in limited, I still think it's it's of reasonable importance. Yeah, it was uh, it was particularly relevant back in the chain mirrors. <laughs> it was uh, your command and conquerors a lot of time coming back on the draw, and then there was a. Uh, you know, there was a deck list that was published sort of after as our after ours, which added in all the flocks, and the flocks just made our commander conquers like infinitely better because flock sort of incentivizes you to play inefficiently and keep an extra card for the arsenal, right? Because you create the token and then you have this redundant card, and usually that gets parts in arsenal. And command and conquer is almost always live, where you know chain was kind of a vomit everything in your hand onto mm-hmm. the board and present as much power as possible but yeah. flock changed that dynamic but in general even before flock of the feather walkers yeah command and conquer going second it was much more likely to be live because chain was one of those decks while plunder run was a great card and would often end up in the arsenal chain was a chain was a deck that was so aggressive that it could just be playing you know five card hand into four card hand into four card hand right it could just utilize all of its resources yeah exactly yeah that's a really good example i don't know if we'll, i'm sure we'll see some of those in the future but it slips down the list a little bit uh so we talked about you know going second and fab chance to get the first impact of one hit effects of course the first chance to take tempo you get to decide with more information and freedom as well to do a mixture of some of the things on on that if you go second so you have an understanding of more about what your opponent's game plan is what they may or may not have an arsenal what their equipment setup is how the game might unfold so going second does gain you information and and that can be that can be important like for instance traditionally you know you flip into Katsu and it was like, oh, is this like a Katsu aggro deck or is this mm-hmm. a Katsu defensive deck? And usually on turn zero, you could tell that. Or turn one, you could tell by their, their equipment flip maybe, but often not. And then you could, you know, they start to play their first attack out or something or they they Kadachi, Kadachi you and then play like a sigil and you're like, okay, cool. All right, I know, yeah. I know where they're at right now. I've got a lot more information about how to how to play my hand. And, and it's, it's, that still happens now as well. Yeah. Um, so I, it's, it is relevant. Not to not to be the the old bag on the, on the podcast, but with chain that was freaking critically okay. relevant because the first cards you pitch because literally from the your your first play of the game you were setting up your pitch stack for the end game for your shackle um, shackle seven shackle eight uh, sort of range but so you would need to be understanding like is this an aggro katsu where I'm never going to see that and or is it a defensive katsu where literally the first card I pitch I need to be ready to sort of either redraw it or banish it and it was super relevant going second because that but you know chain uh to talk about that chain a lot of times which used to go first just because of this this sort of i forget the word we used to use it but just by creating a rune chant it was just like this incremental advantage and it was like it, obviously it was a it was an arsenal a heavy shackle. deck yeah it was a shackle a rune chant and ideally a plunder run an arsenal and that was enough in a highly aggressive tempo oriented matchup to go first as chain that's what we thought back and you then. could you could also filter your hand and not let your opponent filter yours by pitching to the gloves. Anyway, let's use a more modern example for uh, some of the people who are a little bit less ancient than Brendan Patrick, I will say, <laughs> is Icelander versus Ultim in this previous meta. This is something I really considered going into the calling in Auckland was I wanted to find out information immediately from my Ultim opponent. So I played Michael Feng in I think it was the last round of day one playing Ultim. He flips his little Eeyore token, and I'm like, oh, man, is he trying to psych me out here? Is he playing? Is he playing fatigue Ultim? I actually had I thought about it more. I, I remember that he doesn't he doesn't play that archetype mm-hmm. very often anyway. Or is he playing you know, this more proactive? Is he going to present me long head effect? So I had a cyber plan for the unknown, and then it's like, okay, turn zero, he or sorry, turn one, he immediately like shows me. I see a red uh, choke slam, and then I see a red spine. I'm like, okay, he's he's not on this like fatigue defensive nine health gain cards deck so now i can change the way i'm going to play i don't need to be pitching my you know frost hexes and looking for second cycle and stuff like that i'm just going to try and trade damage get my attacks and find some some chip damage with like a frost hex or i need to get insidious chill because it's gonna be really relevant into the end game because he's gonna be presented to be damaged so you know things like that i mean viscera is another great example in recent recent times you know you go second into certain matchups and You'd find out what their kind of plan was. Are they playing a bit more defensive? Are these rune chants going to be more valuable to stack up for next turn? So should I end my turn with a Spellblade Assault or should I end my turn with a, a Rosetta Thorn and just try to be trying to push? Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, you gain information about your opponent's plan. That's kind of what we just talked about. That, that is really important. You Not only do you gain information about what you should do in the game, but you gain information about what your opponent's probably going to try and do for the game. So yeah, those are the main things we're going to second. Well, I do want to ask you uh, some sort of more general questions, and we can talk about CC after. But what, what about Blitz? Blitz is a particularly polarizing format, I think, on this this topic because the life totals are so low. And Let's go the, first. Go first. <laughs> I mean, the the problem with Blitz I have is that if you're playing a deck in Blitz, it's 
probably because it has explosive potential, right? So I think it's going to be, I think you're, it's the opposite. I think you need to find a reason to not go first in this format. Either you're going to have a deck that has a really explosive potential or your opponent's going to. Like it just, I just think that's the way the format, and I could, I could be wrong about this, but I think about Kano, I think about Reiner, I think about all these decks that can just like, I mean, I, and I don't, I'd be, I'll be honest, I don't understand fully the landscape of, of the format right now, but traditionally it has been like, well, I need to find a reason to not go first, to be honest. Yeah, just kill your opponent on turn zero. Um, Hayden, hot topic though, very relevant for everybody listening. Talk to me about Outsiders Limited and the choice of going first or going second and how it sort of changes based on what hero you're playing, your matchup, et cetera. Yeah, it's... I think it's not super straightforward. I think the default is to to go second for sure. Uh, the the Rangers in particular, like Riptide going second, just feels so good. You know, you draw a trap and your opponent tries to like push some damage on turn one. Maybe there's something like Benji or there, you know, even they just they just feel they can push some damage on turn one and you trap them and then get to reload like an arrow for a five card hand. Like that that can be crazy. Or maybe they should filter. Um, and then if not, then you just get you just get the first hand of tempo, which is really relevant. I think in this format. Where it can be a little bit more difficult is like Arachne is like a really good deck going second. Benji doesn't mind, which is super interesting as well because it can potentially punish with some evasive damage on turn turn zero. But then also can also do it on turn one. Like so, you put you in a really tough spot. So uh, I think it. I think this kind of consideration of oh, you want to go first for fatigue reasons, you know, to swing swing with your spider's bite, for instance. It, it's not. It's not happening in draft to be honest. It, it really just isn't. So mm-hmm. the, the deck quality is just so much higher than than seal. So I think it's. I'm merely a go second format. Okay. Makes sense. I think that that is, yeah, I mean, we talk about the dynamic sort of breaking a little bit on formats like in Blitz. In Blitz is a format where it's, I think it, it's more, it's more correct to go first in Blitz than it is in any other maybe. format. And I think in, I know, but yeah, maybe, right. But in any other format, and I think in Limited, it's more correct to go second than it is in any other format. Like it, it's going to be more across the board. Like it, it tends to be in Limited, it's go, going second is going to be correct. Not always, but tends to be. Um, good to know. Hayden, anything you want to sort of close out with on this on this question of going first and, uh, first or second in Flesh and Blood? Yeah, it really relates back to some of the really core fundamentals we talk about when it comes to preparing for events, which is game plans. If you've got your game plan sorted, you 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 will know whether you want to go first and second. I mean, you should. It's part of your decision process, I think, of whether you want to go first or second. And also, if you're preparing for events, whiteboard notes, things like this, preparing your game plans for a tournament, you also have the opportunity to think, okay, what is my opponent doing? And does my decision of winning the die roll change because of that? I can't count the amount of times that I'm in an event. I mean, I've done this myself. Uh, you're in an event and you win the die roll and your opponent goes... Ooh, I might mean, get first or second in this match. <laughs> <laughs> and it's like, I, I don't know, you've won the die roll, you, you tell me. So you can just eliminate, like with sideboarding and not needing to think by just having a sideboard plan written down, you can eliminate that by just doing the same thing with going first versus second, I think. Yeah. Um, just just speaking back to my ancient chain example, when I when I had chosen with the Command and Conquer example, I had actually I played that player in Swiss and I was not playing them in top eight. Um, and I had chosen to go second even though I won the die roll and we like we had mentioned, we usually chose to go first for a very good reason. But specifically because of Command and Conquers and specifically because Flock of the Feather Walkers uh in particular, I did choose to go second. So it, it changed throughout the tournament because I now understood my opponent's deck. Um, and yeah, that can happen because you're playing an opponent twice, or maybe you have like a bit of a read on what they're on, or your opponent, your teammate played them, whatever. Well, you'll like this one then because it kind of contradicts, well, it doesn't contradict, but it's a bit of a, I think it's a, it's a qualification to that. And I want to say is I think the most important thing, first of all, if you're trying to order these in your is to understand what is your game plan first what is best for you and i would say just if you're unsure don't overcomplicate it like mm-hmm. do the thing that you you feel and know is best for your deck i think i've had situations where i've just overthought this i can i was in singapore for the calling last year and i played into a viscerai mirror and in testing i just like overthought the viscerai mirror i was like you want to go you want to go second and you want to play like arcane uh, barrier equipment and you want to like do this particular setup and it was just like I just overthought it the correct decision so I want to die roll put myself second my opponent immediately just goes like mm, make eight rune chance pass the turn and I was just like already lost the game basically <laughs> because of a, just a, a poor decision so I just think just don't over over complicate it stick to what you know about your deck what you're finding about the format but you know there is opportunities to think a little bit deeper but just you know, don't go off the boil awesome well that concludes episode 104 of Arsenal Pass 
to go first or to go second, to be or not to be. Um, there is a YouTube version. If you're listening to this on a podcast platform, there's a YouTube video version at youtube.com slash Pass. Hayden and I are on Twitter. Hayden's at Fien underscore Dale at Brendan APG. Arsenal Pass has a Twitter as well. I think it's at Arsenal Pass, just straight up. Uh, a lot of shorts being posted on there, so check it out. We do have the Patreon. Um, like I mentioned, the Deck Tech with Bodie Spurlock just went up as we were recording this, so probably two to three days before you are listening to this. Go check that out. Brody's an incredible player, and like I said, he does have an additional Deck Tech Deck guy up on the Arsenal Pass Patreon, so make sure you take a look at that as well. Episode 104, two years in the book. See you next week for 105, Aiden. See you later.